banks have become an essential threat to our democracy. So consider this justice. Thank you for listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com, the number one listener-supported radio station on the internet. Please help support this station so this battle can continue forward. Revolution Radio! The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host... Welcome to Sacred Matrix, a divine paradigm of love and universal consciousness, with your host, Janet Kira Lesson and Dr. Sasha Lesson. Together, we transform the world. And now, here are your hosts, Janet Kira and Dr. Sasha Lesson. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Oh, jeez, got feedback. Hold on. Okay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> welcome. Uh, my name is Janet Kira Lesson. This is the Sacred Matrix, and I'm here with my co-host, Dr. Sasha Alex Lesson, and my producer, a mad painter. And today, our guest is. Um, Elizabeth April on the first hour. I just lost my page that I put up to tell you about her, so I'm going to navigate to that. Uh, Elizabeth April is a lovely lady from Canada, from um, the Toronto area, and she is an experiencer. Dr. Lesson, Sasha, Alex, are you there? Well, I get this uh, page back up for Aquarian Radio so I can read a little bit about our guest, Elizabeth April, and then the second hour is Nadine Lalich, Lalich, L-A-L-I-C-H. And both of these ladies are experiencers and are going to be presenting, uh, feature presenters at our Stargate to the Cosmos Expo, October 25th to 28th in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Okay, Sasha, are you there? Uh oh, we're having problems. Is anybody there? I'm here. A bad painter's there. Okay. It's showing, it's showing Sasha and April here. Yep. Okay. On YouTube. Elizabeth. Hi, hi, Elizabeth. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on with Sasha. Oh, uh, I'm going to have to poke my head in there, but if I go near him with this phone, it goes doop, boop, boop. So I have to mute it, I guess, both first. So how about. Um, you start and tell our listeners a little bit about your story, who you are and your journey. And I'm going to see if I can figure out. Here it is. I'm going to mute this while I head um, in the back there and see if I can figure it, help him get on there. So go ahead, Elizabeth. Welcome to our show. It's Great. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, for having me, as usual. So I guess I'll uh, tell people a little bit about who I am. And um, yeah, so I'm uh, right now I'm uh, 26. I just had my birthday. And I consider myself to be a, a psychic clairvoyant channeler. So I have the ability or the capacity to go into other realms, other dimensions, and channel information for an individual, for humanity as a whole. Um, and basically my purpose, my role, my mission here on this planet is to raise the vibrational frequency. So I do that through sharing and spreading information. 
And of course, I didn't start off being this really beautiful, wonderful channeler. Uh, you know, my life has definitely been a struggle leading me up uh, to this point. And I feel like right now at this time, everyone's going through their own awakening. And I feel like up until this point, my entire life has been a bit of an awakening. And when I was younger, I was uh, able to see ghosts and spirits and, and energies and auras. And so I was really tuned in uh, almost to an extent where I didn't have healthy boundaries on what I could do and, and uh, where I could go. And so at a certain point in time, I decided to shut off and shut down uh, those spiritual gifts and abilities just to, to ground myself, just for the sake of fitting in and being, being normal. Um, and it wasn't until I was 16 where I started to really just question things in my reality. I mean, at that point in time, um, I was going through a lot of emotions. Uh, I didn't really know what my place was in the world. I didn't really know where I wanted to go or why I was even here. So I was doing a lot of questioning um, through a lot of depression. And I finally came to um, a past life regression. And this past life regression basically opened me up to who I've been in past lifetimes and how I've been able to ser serve and, and give back to humanity through information and channeling and oracle stuff and healing and, and all that great stuff. So, um, so yeah, so 16 basically opened me up, you know, opened that can of worms to, uh, to simultaneous time and past lifetimes and, and something that's beyond this life, you know, what you see in the mirror. And then it wasn't until 18, about two years later, where I had my first conscious abduction. And, uh, and that's basically where I was taken by extraterrestrial beings. And, uh, and I came back and, and obviously my, my reality was blown out of the water once again in understanding that, you know, not only is time simultaneous and we've lived other lifetimes before, but then I opened my reality up to the fact that you know, we've also lived other lifetimes off of this planet. And I started to really open my eyes um, and realize that I, I am actually part of one of these interdimensional races. And I believe that everyone in their own right is a hybrid themselves. And, uh, and so that's kind of what I teach today is that everyone is there a hybrid and we all have very special and divine gifts and abilities and connections to tap into. And uh, and that's basically oh, yeah, April, you know uh, uh, yeah. Can you tell to tell us the content of the the particular of a, a seminal past life that sort of changed everything for you? What was what was the story? Who were you in? Yeah, absolutely. So um, okay, are you are you asking me about one past life in particular or the past life regression that, that one, I? Yeah, that one that one that yeah. really changed everything for you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so yes, there's definitely a past lifetime um, that really kind of uh, opened me up and, and really kind of blew, blew the lid off the water. So, so this is a past lifetime and this was in, um, I believe it was like ancient Aztec times um, in some sort of jungle. I forget where it was. I think it was around Peru. And I was, um, what do I want to call myself? Like a, some sort of shaman. I was a guru. I was a teacher. I was a, you know, I just meditated for most of my time. And, uh, and I was actually chosen at a very young age in that lifetime um, to be one of the, the leaders of this civilization based on my special gifts and abilities. And so uh, in that lifetime, I would bring a group of us, uh, monks, you could call us. I don't, I'm not totally sure what we were, shamans, monks. And I would bring a group of us together and, uh, and we would go all the way to the top of one of these pyramids. And it looks very similar to the, uh, the, the pyramids in Mexico with the flat tops. And this pyramid in particular had a, a flat roof, but the roof was open and there was this giant square that was carved out of the roof of this pyramid and so when we went up into this pyramid and we had these ceremonies as these shaman monks um we would look up and the stars would be all above us and there was this energy of summoning and the energy of summoning was this energy of summoning interdimensional species to come teach us so we were the teachers of our civilization but yet we had teachers ourselves and um 
And I remember during that past life repression, when I was going through this lifetime of, of me being this Aztec priest or priestess or whatever, um, I remember sitting, so it was this, this, uh, this monk, you know, guru guy, and I came into the, the top of the pyramid and I was the last one to join the circle. And the second that I sat down and I closed my eyes, I literally felt my soul connect to the souls of the seven other monks who were in that circle and together as one collective unit we literally like broke through the the pains of dimensions and we went into the center of the universe to receive downloads and information i mean this is without plant medicine or ayahuasca this is actually releasing dmt or dimethyltryptamine in the pineal gland just through meditation and uh and so so when I was having this past life regression and I, and I saw myself as this, this monk, you know, at the top of this pyramid, um, I would literally feel myself get out of my body, but I couldn't conceptualize what I saw when I was releasing the DMT. But I remember that when I came back into my body, I would teach um, the rest of the civilization what we had learned. And some of my teachings are actually still carved within the stone of some of those buildings in that in the ancient Mayan culture uh, so that was one lifetime that really just allowed me to understand my capacity for expansion for astral travel for receiving information and for teaching humanity and I remember during the past life regression that was the last lifetime that I went into and I cried like I was like bawling my eyes out because finally it all made sense that there was something so much more than just what we thought that there was and and it was so beautiful in taking the power back and understanding that i myself could access that information from going within and i could teach everyone else how to access that information from going within within themselves as well so that was definitely one of the past lifetimes that really you know uh, opened me up to the possibilities and allowed me to understand myself at a much deeper level Okay, so, you know, that sounds like, in a way, uh, you, you said abduction, but it sounds like you were giving, in essence, a consent in this past life to uh, being a, a contact person. Uh, it, it, and that maybe you weren't abducted, but you, you were, uh, well, did you consent? I guess that's the real question to when you started having what you called an abduction. Oh, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I believe all abductions are consent, whether we consent for that in this lifetime or in other lifetimes. But I mean, all almost all of my past lives have to do with um, alien contact, and it doesn't necessarily have to be in person, although usually it is. And the reason being is because I was an interdimensional being far, far before I was ever a human here on this planet. And I remember you know, channeling and having downloads. And, and because, I, you know, I'm in a realm and a space where time just doesn't exist for me, I'm able to travel back in time. I'm able to travel, you know, forward into the future just because I hop myself into a dimension that doesn't exist within time at all, which is the fifth dimension, when the fourth dimension itself is time. So basically, when I hop in, when I started having these abductions and, and started, you know, getting contacted by what I would call my soul family, um, I started having these very vivid re call and very vivid flashbacks of myself as an interdimensional being and my species that i come from are called the the tall grays or the zetas and um and one of the very very powerful moments of realization and and vivid vivid flashback and recall it was like recalling a memory from childhood like it was just so clear and so visceral for me which is when i was a tall gray i remember sitting down at this huge uh, very, what do I want to call it? Uh, oval, but a very elongated oval table. And so we, there was about uh, 10 of us and we were all sitting down and there was two Palladians and the rest were all these gray, gray ambassadors or of the high elite. And, um, and we were talking about my human existence here on this planet. And, you know, of course, I was a part of the experiment of the humans or the humanity um, before humans were ever human. So I was a part of like the genetic makeup and, and, and helping, um, you know, plant all of the right seeds for our, for our fifth dimensional evolution. And so it wasn't enough for me to just, I don't want to say just experiment on the humans or cre help create the humans. You know, I really wanted to dive into this thing called being human so at that time i sat down we all sat down at this round table 
And, um, and we planned out all of my human lifetimes on this planet. And I decided what I wanted to learn. And I, and I decided how I wanted to learn those things. And I decided how I wanted to help awaken humanity and what positions I wanted to put myself in and what risks I was willing to take in order to complete my mission here on this planet. And I, and I remember very specifically, very, very specifically planning out this lifetime right here, right now um, that I'm living in. Because not, not only is this my very last lifetime here on this planet thank goodness um but this is also one of the most important lifetimes here on this planet because i'm taking all of the human lessons all of the you know lifetimes all of the experiences all of the knowledge and wisdom from traveling the universe and i'm compiling it into this one lifetime to give humanity the biggest blast that i've g- ever given them in any lifetime and so it was, it was quite what, shocking what, 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 for me yeah mm-hmm. What made you yeah, choose Canada? Uh, I, I want to test my mic here. Hi, can you guys hear me? Can everybody yeah. hear me? Yeah, we, I was just asking, uh, uh, you know, Elizabeth, why she chose Canada for the, her last lifetime. Yes, so... Um, so this lifetime for me is all about travel. So I am a bit of a nomad and uh, and I will be traveling quite quite a bit um, in this lifetime, especially with like, you know, speaking tour, tours and whatnot. Um, but I chose Canada as my home base because Canada is very safe. And I started to learn that a lot later on. And when I was younger, I, I was, uh, I was like, well, I, I want to make, I want to make a name for myself. I, I need to let people know this information. Like, you know, I just, I had this, I've always had this, you know, push this need, this want to spread this information and yell it from the rooftops to as many people as possible. And I was angry that I'd placed myself in Canada because Canada doesn't have a very far network. It doesn't have a very far reach. And, um, and so, so I was angry about that. And then eventually I ended up getting a very strong message through meditation that I needed to be in Canada as my home base for the safety and the protection, not only environmentally, uh, but also energetically and vibrationally. So that's what Canada provides me. But uh, but I'm planning on you know many different worldly adventures moving forward. Hi. Okay, I'm here. We we're switching out. Uh, so we're at the proper stations. So um, we met you in Canada. I think Canada is a lovely place. But you were upset that it wasn't. What what, what were you expecting? Uh, on some level, you chose all this, so it was perfect. Absolutely. Uh, your ego Absolutely. self, what were you thinking that you needed in, in order to accomplish your mission better or faster? Or whatever? I, I, I felt like I needed more population, and I felt like I needed more exposure and more reach, and I felt like the U.S. was going to give me that. You know what I mean? Um, right. And that's, that's where some of the frustration when I was younger came in. But at the same time, I mean... Um, you know, I've, I've got some traveling plans and I've, I've, uh, I've, I've actually been really drawn to LA recently. So I'm kind of in the works of, uh, you know, getting a mainstream TV opportunity in LA and then, you know, once again, planting the right seeds, not going as deep as I go on radio shows, but, you know, but planting uh-huh. the right seeds in the mainstream so that they can start waking up to the fact that there's so much more that we're not actually looking at. And I hope to provide some answers for some people who have a growing restlessness that I know I had within myself for basically this entire lifetime. So I'm, I'm hoping that some other people are feeling me when I say that, you know, are you lost? Are you like, do you feel like something is missing? You know, because there is, we're not uh-huh. taught what that thing is. We're not taught about vibrational frequency and, and us as consciousness. And, you know, so there's a lot of, a lot of missing pieces that I hope to, uh, to give people, you know, in who I am and the knowledge and information that I can access. Well, I think you're, pretty far along with having the information you that you come with from your other to me they're simultaneous lifetimes i have many simultaneous i exist everywhere <laughs> and it's, yeah. it's very kind of weird to say and it, it, it part of me wants to choke what i say but we are all multi, multi-dimensional beings simultaneously having yeah. many experiences and many incarnations and dimensions and vibratory frequencies and planets and everything but of course you tried to hold it out once you'd go crazy so as a <laughs> um, this part this thread that came down into 3d uh human dimension form where we tend to kind of um rotate you know where we focus our attention so we're gonna focus our attention right now and being <laughs> janet april and sasha and, and thomas and then in our dream state we probably 
up to who we are in the other realms. I, I have awareness that I go other places and I have a job and all kinds of stuff. So that's interesting that you're going. Uh, I was just talking to somebody. Uh, oh, my friend uh, Barbara. We're doing this first conference in Albuquerque, and and she lives in LA. She says, "Well, let's do one here." So just planting that seed. Yeah, that, that, that might be where we do. 2019 is in LA because it, it is. Um, it's kind of a hub for us. It's really easy to get to. And uh, Sasha's sister lives there. So as long as they don't, uh, they're not on fire at the time we're there. I think I can breathe the air. That's the only problem mm-hmm. I have trouble with the air. So, okay, so you, your primary identification besides being human is being the tall, the, the tall Zetas. And how tall are the Zetas, the tall Zetas? Is that yeah, what you said? Did I get that so, correct? Yep, the tall grays, the tall Zetas. Yeah, the Zetas. Um, so I'm like basically seven and a half, eight feet tall, which I always say is a cruel joke from the universe because I'm in like a five foot, you know, I've met both of you in person. I'm in this little tiny, like 12 year old body, you know? And so right. I always like kind of laugh and say like, you know, it's that I'm so used to being like eight foot tall. And when I was younger, I would uh, stand on anything like a cat. Like I would stand on anything that I could to get taller. And now I realize why that felt like more uh-huh. of my natural state of being. Um, but yeah, I mean, and I also simultaneously exist as a, a mantis being as well. And his name is Khan and the Zeta's name is Hira. So I'm like kind of like transitioning between both of them, um, you know, simultaneously, but I'm, I'm uh, practicing being human much more often, I guess you could say. So what is the function you, you know, of the tall... Oh, go ahead. You ask a question. Then come back to that one because I'm looking at the. Well, you know, I've, I've hardly ever met anyone that has energy of of the mantis, and they're so mysterious. Our uh, secret uh, space uh, program people say there's mantids uh, on on Mars, and they're important actors. And uh, can you tell me what that's that's all about? What's what is this mantis uh, being? What is the essence of mantisism? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. So, um, so what I've channeled, right. And I just have to let everyone know that, I mean, the research that you've done or what you feel yourself might not resonate with the information that I have, which is totally okay because I don't do any external research. So what I know is just what I've channeled. Um, but basically the essence, the key essence of mantis, like I like to call them the masters of the universe. Um, as in any higher dimensional being, they can either t- take a, a physical form in a three, third dimensional realm, or they can take a non-physical form. So basically when I say like um, higher dimensional, like anything from the eighth dimension and above, I can either see and perceive physically, or they can switch to a non-physical body. So they've got both. I am dealing with like my, my higher self, my mantis being is a non-physical mantis, which means that he's like 40 feet tall. Like he is huge and he sits, he sits like in the center of the universe. Like, I don't really know how else to describe that, but every time I astral travel to him and it's usually a far distance away, you know, he just has galaxies and stars and just beautiful, you know, space around him. Um, now there's, there's the physical mantis as well. And they're about, I think they're about 10 feet tall. They're pretty big. Um, and kind of scary looking cause they're, they're so, um, like insectoid looking, but, but basically they're the masters of the universe. So they're kind of like the managers. Like if you see them on ships and stuff, they're usually overviewing, you know, the functionality of the ship. You know, my mantis in particular, you know, I call him the master of the universe because he overviews the functionality of all of the civilizations and all of the species within the universe. Now, mantis are very usually non-intervention. And just like every species, there's positive and negative. I've only ever dealt with very positive and loving mantis beings. And, um, and so, so yeah, so they just, they're kind of like managers. They're just kind of overseeing everything. I mean, they don't consider themselves God. They don't really create a whole lot. They just kind of make sure everything's functioning as it needs to. Positive, negative, good, bad, the ugly. So that's kind of, uh, so I get a lot of downloads and information from my mantis being just on where's the universe at, you know? Uh, It's pretty cool. Uh, What does the mantis tell you about the, the suffering on this planet? 
Oh my goodness. I mean, it's really funny. Like my mantis has a really uh, great sense of humor, but sometimes he can be so coy in his answers that like, I just, you just have to laugh. So, so basically like uh, his response to the suffering on this planet is, is, you know, it's, it's all happening for a reason. Like it's all just, it is what it is. Like there's no, like that. I don't know. Like there's just, there's nothing else to say other than everything is in divine alignment and I mean, there's all these negative forces that be, but they're all in divine alignment and negative, positive, good, bad, ugly. Like, you know, the light and the dark are just illusions of this linear dimension. They don't actually exist. Right. So, I mean, the, once again, with the energy of non-intervention, it's really important that these higher vibrational beings don't really intervene in the flow of, of, um, of humanity. Wow. You know, that's exactly, I, I'm an existentialist, and that's exactly the conclusion that I've come to. Just exactly what you've said. Beautiful. Uh, Janet's had some experience with Mantis, too. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah I've, I've had experience as well. The Mantis I had was uh, helping me heal from a molestation. And um, I was just devastated. <laughs> I had never been, you know, treated that way. And so I went to bed like, oh, I just don't even want to live anymore. How can I, how can I be in this planet? Because I've always had the stranger in a strange world phenomenon, being extraterrestrial. Yeah. I, you know, I just didn't fit here, right? And and then to get um, molested, it was just uh, very traumatizing. So, oh, uh, I just wanted to go home <laughs> when I went to bed that night. And the mantis uh, responded and held me. It was a female mantis or feminine energy, and she just held me in her arms and surrounded me with this incredible uh, energy and sent it through me. And I was about the size of a an infant in its arms. So I was about 10 years yeah. old. So, you know, look at the scale. I don't, I'm not sure how, I wasn't like looking at it from the ground to see how tall it was, but it was very, very large. And it yeah. just uh, held me lovingly and then returned me. Now the tall the very tall gray like you're describing. When I went to Johnson A Tunnel, I was under the uh, underground facility, underwater facility there, and I, that's when I saw the dragon, which I'll be talking about the dragon at the conference. We're going to put all these stories together and work together at the <laughs> conference. Um, that this was the leader. This guy was heading mm -hmm. up. He had the very, uh, I guess there were three, three to four feet grays running around, and there were. Uh, like uh, five, five something, you know, about five feet tall grays. And of course, like humans, they're not all exactly the same height. You know, they, they vary. They, they have a tendency to be, oops, something happened here. Um, anyway, um, I've had experience with uh, many hundreds of thousands of types of beings. Can you still hear me? I'm yeah. starting to get feedback for some reason. Okay. Okay. Um, and I, I was very blessed. Have you been to any of the council meetings? And if so, could you describe what you experienced when you were? Because it sounds like you have a an important role when you're on board ship and or on other planets. So what is your role? And um, have you been to? You said you were at some kind of meeting deciding coming here, but what other meetings have you attended? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um so, yeah, so my role as a gray was an ambassador for my species. And I had another, um, there was another ambassador as well uh, for the species. And, uh, and so that was my role at that time. Now they consider me an ambassador for humanity, but there's many ambassadors on this planet. And, um, and so uh, some of, I've been to many meetings. I definitely used to consciously go to them a lot more often when my mind wasn't so preoccupied um, with human stuff but um but yeah so i get invited to meetings almost monthly and they are meetings from the galactic federation of light and uh, typically it's the palladian security council meetings that i go to that's what i call it anyway and uh, and it's it's basically around um is everything with humanity flowing? Are we going in the right direction? Is there anything that these ambassadors need to know in order to spread for this information for humanity's awakening? So we kind of like do a little check-in every month. Um, I went to a really important meeting on December 21st of 2012, and um, I got huge downloads before the meeting, and I got 
um, I got greeted by like three or four different beings in the, the week leading up to um, December 21st, 2012. And they told me that at 4 a.m. on December 21st, 2012, I needed to be in a meditative state because I needed to astral travel and be consciously aware of the meeting that was taking place. And the meeting actually took place inside the moon. I don't know if you were aware, but the moon is actually hollow, <laughs> um, from what I understand anyway. And, no. uh, and it was basically, uh-huh. okay, cool. And uh, yeah, so it was basically this big, um, this big conference room and all of the, I want to call them all of the ambassadors, all of the 144,000 souls on this planet were in attendance and they were all astral, astrally there. And then there was a ton of other species all in attendance from the Galactic Federation of Light. So within this galaxy. So all these different beings were there. It was really cool. And it was like an update on the coming four or five years. Um, and, and how important it was and what we all needed to be prepared for and, you know, all of this great stuff. So, and that really kind of kicked off. Okay, cool. I'm here. I'm, you know, doing my, uh, my mission and, and I'm progressing and I'm helping humanity and, and all these other people are also helping humanity, which is so beautiful. And, uh, and then, and then every once in a while I'll, I'll get greeted in meditation or I'll have a being come into my living room and they'll tell me, Hey, you know, next week you have to be aware there's a meeting and there's something that we have to let you know so that you can, um, you know, explain that to humanity. So I, you know, I still attend, but not as, it's not as a, uh, as frequent as it had been. And I think actually in this past year, a lot of spirit guides, a lot of interdimensional beings have all been backing off. And I don't know if you two have felt that as well. Um, and basically it's because they're giving us space to expand ourselves and to go through the third dimension emotions and the purging mm-hmm. of energy that we have to go through. So a lot of my clients a lot of these high vibrational light workers are all like elizabeth tell me like what's going on i don't hear my guides anymore like have they left me at my worst time ever you know and i just have to remind them no no they haven't left they're still around you but they're allowing you to stand in your own power and purge and release and figure out your human stuff on your own so that you can come to a higher vibrational place where you two can meet in the middle so you have more of a one-on-one conversation. So there was, there's kind of been, uh, been that energy as well within the past year of a little bit of, you know, humans just need time to be human, to purge out human stuff so that 2019 and 2020, we can hit it hard with the expansion of consciousness. Have you ever met any uh, uh, people in in this lifetime, uh, you know, now that you saw in these meetings or in the uh, other visits that you've uh, taken in your uh, travels, astral and uh, physical? Um, That's a really good question. So I would say overall, I have met uh, one member of my light tribe, which I call it. So it's like a tribe of light warriors or light, yeah, light warriors. And like we defend dark energy with white light and all this stuff. And we go in these epic battles and I don't know, it's really wild. Uh, so I met one person in person who, who did that. And then just the other day I had um, a interview with the uh, YouTube channel. Um, oh my goodness. What is it called? Uh, the leak project. And, you know, I was talking about these abductions when I was a child by the greys and how they taught me in schools and in and on board the ship in this this earth school for for earth children, you know, where they taught us about energy and vibration and quantum physics and all this stuff, you know, um, I was talking about, uh, you know, what it all looked like and my experiences and what they were teaching and who was teaching us. And I got contacted by about two or three people after that interview. And they told me that they were on board that ship with me and that they recognized me from the ship from when we were younger. And they're all over the world. These people are all over the world. And I'm not surprised because, you know, it's like this selection of, of little tiny lightworker children who were taken and taught and trained so that we could all spread a message here on this planet. And everyone who contacted me was in on their path, on their mission, either doing healing work or creating mandalas or whatever it was, they were definitely spreading a message. So that was pretty, pretty cool and pretty powerful. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. So uh, Elizabeth, what you said that um, you went to these meetings and they said they told you what's going to happen in the next four or five years. Yeah. What is going to happen? 
That's a really good question. Um, I will just let, let, let everyone know before I kind of go into what I've channeled is that once again, anything and everything can change. I mean, every, every single entity, every being on this planet has free will to change the future, right? To make any choices they want to make. So anything could potentially happen. But <laughs> that being said, I have been getting a very clear message since 2012 of basically what's happening on the planet at this time. Um, I've channeled from the Palladian Council with the uh, Galactic Federation of Light that um, there has been a collapse of our previous reality, which popped us into another parallel reality, which is creating this effect called the Mandela Effect. And with this hopping of parallel realities, we have a third dimension reality on this planet and we have a fifth dimension reality on this planet. What I have channeled is that by 2020, the third dimension reality, the third parallel, third dimension parallel reality within this scope of simultaneous realities, it's going to collapse. And the way that I channeled that it's going to collapse is actually through nuclear war. Now, that's just what I've channeled. Um, I've also been taught and, and told by these uh, within these meetings that there's going to be a collapse of this planet and there's going to be a bit of a depopulation. Some of this depopulation is the fault of human and some of the depopulation is the fault of the energetic and magnetic pole shift that's also happening on this planet at this time. So things like flooding, volcanoes, uh, hurricanes, um, you know, uh, tsunamis, these are all very possible in our near future and they're currently happening right now and uh and so basically they told me that there was going to be this destruction there's, there was going to be this collapse of, of humanity but in the wake of the collapse you know in the aftermath of the collapse there's going to be an enlightenment um and that's for everyone who is here who is at the right place at the right time who is guided in all of these different directions we are going to be the seed planters of the rest of humanity and the rest of humanity are going to be the ones who are ready to heal and to evolve and to awaken. So that's basically what I've channeled. So 2020 is that date, like 2020 is that year where all of the collapse that has been happening for the past 10 years is going to essentially, I mean, everything's still going to collapse, but it's going to essentially ease off and the awakening and the higher vibration of frequency is going to arrive and that's also when i've channeled that finally the 144,000 high vibrational beings uh, ambassadors ascended master whatever you want to call them the 144,000 are going to be here on this planet which is going to allow the entire 7 billion population on this planet shift into a higher vibrational frequency we are waiting for the rest of the 144,000 anchors on this planet in order to raise the rest of the people on this planet so that we can all start living a 5d life uh you know full of abundance and opportunity and manifestation so the 144,000 is kind of a biblical reference so tell us again who are these 144,000 or is it kind of like do they know who they are or are they waking up to who they are you know so, what is that like um, so it's really funny because I was told by the Palladian Security Council uh, during a personal meeting with me that um, that there's these 144,000 uh, light workers on this planet, or there's about to be, and and they basically told me that once there's 144,000 souls that are elevated souls, um, the that's when that's the time when Christ consciousness is basically going to come back, and we are going to evolve, uh, and we're going to hop into another dimension together as a collective unity consciousness and so i'm like okay 144,000. that's a weird number and then i look it up and apparently it's all over the bible or it's this big biblical thing you know i never knew what the right. 144 were but they told me about it and then i'm like oh my goodness of course that makes sense you know everyone is receiving information from the same source but everyone is perceiving it in a very different way so the 144,000 has always been prophesized as being you know that time when earth is going to change and that's basically what they told me is that these 144,000 myself included are ambassadors for this planet which means that they're just basically it means that they're interdimensional beings who have chosen to be here in this third dimensional existence to raise the vibration so that we can progress and move forward as a civilization as a humanity and um 
And so, uh, yeah. And so right now, last time I channeled it, I think I channeled 123,000. That's where we're at right now on this planet. It's so funny because there's so many high vibrational women who are all, all getting unexpectedly pregnant and they're all coming to me and they're saying, Elizabeth, what's going on? Like I wasn't, didn't want to have a baby in this lifetime. I wanted to be free and rub around and whatever. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, boom, you know, you're pregnant. And the reason being is because all of these uh, beings in the Galactic Federation and, and everyone is, is pushing all of these interdimensional beings to come to this planet. So if you have the right vibration and you're high enough, you are going to be attracting a pregnancy in your life that is basically going to bring in one of these 144,000 light beings you know, on this earth so that we can basically make our deadline of 2020. So that's, yes, yeah, so that's kind of what I've channeled about the 144,000. Wow, Josh, did you have a question? Well, it's just I, I, okay. So, so one of the things that, that's constantly on my mind is uh, when, when you uh, regress uh, to a past life. In some sense, you're there, and I'm wondering if changing some whether you have any ability by changing the past to alter the present and the future. Okay, so that's a really good question, and this is where we would get into quantum physics, and this is where we get into paradoxes. Because when I started to really break through the, 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 the reality of this matrix, right? Basically, when I started to break through space-time itself, when I was 18, I really started to break down all of these walls. I'm like, oh my goodness, if I can tap into the past and I can tap into the future, the past, the present, and the future are all an illusion. Linear time does not exist, which means that I can change the past. And quantum mm -hmm. physics and, and, and CERN and the, and the Hydron Collider has actually proven that we can, by efficiently changing the present moment, we can effectively change the past. Like that is actually proven by the Hydron Collider, which mm -hmm. is, you know, revolutionary. And, uh, and so, yes, in a sense, the past can be changed. But this is where the paradox comes in, which is there are certain elements and aspects of the past that simply are unable to be changed. Like it's almost like a loop, right? So if you change one, it's like the butterfly effect, but backwards. If you change one thing about the past, even a small thing, um, then all of a sudden the series of events unfolds and it would supposedly change the present moment. But if it was something really, really big, like um, World War III or whatever, if, something, if it was something that was so predestined contracted to happen, there are an infinite number of realities and an infinite number of variables where that thing happens no matter what. So even if you try so hard to change the past, there's going to be a series of events that leads to the next parallel reality that leads to the same conclusion anyway, because it's a loop effect of what needed to happen in the first place. So even if it's perceived of, as of negative or bad or low vibration or dark, and, and, and it really has to happen, no matter what you do, that still has to happen, and you just cannot change it, if that makes sense. You do make sense. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I was shown when I was uh, four on board the craft, and then uh, once on the craft, I was my eternal self. I was shown 24 potential future histories, um, mm. multiverses, whatever you want to call them. And uh, I was instructed that I was the observer participant and that I had choice about which reality I, cho I would traverse. So, in a way, those things are kind of set in stone in some variations of the theme. Yeah. But the person can choose where they want to go because all the potentialities exist everywhere. If you can imagine it, it exists. It is. It's a possibility. Yes. So, have you in, in experienced any of those things? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, then then we're just talking about, you know, manifestation, right? And then... Well, I mean, it's so beautiful because all of these concepts are so large, but they all fold into one another so effortlessly. And when you think about what you want to manifest in the future, just like you said, whatever you can imagine, you know, it, it, it actually is, it exists, uh, which means all of your thoughts are simultaneously projecting into these parallel realities. And the more intention and attention and energy you put behind one thought or another, you know, the more you're creating that in your reality. So, I mean, 
there's just there's just so much that you can tap into at all times. All you have to do is bring awareness to all of those things. Wow. Right. So, so even if you are, in a way, we're all co-creating this, and, and where you put your focus, your attention, and that's where you go. Mm-hmm. Is that? You know, that oh, absolutely. That's I'm getting that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, so yes, careful what sure. you and then, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. And then as a as a collective as a collective society, we have like we but you know, as a collective we have created in, in the United States of America, we've created um we've created Trump. We've created Donald Trump. I mean that is the I like that is the you know utmost projection of um, of the American society and, and all of their intentions and their wants and desires have accumulated into one man, you know, which is really interesting uh, to even observe on, on that level. So, um, so yeah, so of well, course, oh, I, mean, I think that we, can, yeah. Yeah. I think looking at the whole systems, like systems analysts that I am, is that we periodically create um, that over the top personality uh, yeah. Each generation has their over-the-top personality, and, you know, we had uh, Napoleon. What was the time frame yeah. of Napoleon, honey? You're the historian. And then, uh, you know, we had Hitler. So I remember as a child, since I'm a, a baby boomer, my parents were totally uh, strung out on PTSD from having gone through World War II. And coming up into World War II, my, you know, they were starving and struggling with the, you know, the Great Depression of the 19, uh, what was it, 30s. So, uh, so I know it's, it seems like it's the United States that creates this, but I think the polarity uh, stretches out across the continuum and the light materializes somewhere and the dark materializes somewhere else. And, and then the continuum, you know, kind of shifts around the planet. And um, so that's why they say the power, the center of power periodically rotates from, you know, it started the, like in um, Africa with the Sumerians and it went up to, you know, Rome and then spread up through to England and then out across the world. And, and uh, you know, the story is it might shift to China, but I think it's that on that level, it's the human story. And it's what we as humanity are creating. Um, and it's very profound to, to witness and <laughs> I'm not sure what to do about it, except each day I do my piece of the puzzle. What can I do to maintain peace on Earth and let it begin with me? What do you guys yeah. think of that? Yeah. Are you asking saying, both of them? I have another perspective. Everybody, yes. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I have a question that's, that's burning, but I want to hear hear the answer to what you just posed first. So, what do you got to say, Elizabeth? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like, I I completely agree. Like, I think we're we're just all here, you know, experiencing life, and and um, and we just have to, you know, it's really important as humans to just take a big back step and and understand that we're just one very small piece of, of a very big puzzle and uh, and and understanding that we're here for a reason, but not getting caught up in, you know, every little tiny aspect of that. So it's um, yeah, I completely agree with um, what Janet's saying there. OK, and, and what, I, what I'm interested in is you, you have a child, right? Do you have a uh, child? No, no, I do not have a child. No. Okay, because I, because I, what Susie Hansen and other people have been saying is the kids of people like you are the ones that are going to take us through. And I just, and, and what you just said about all the pregnancies, uh, uh, I just wondered about that. Are these, you know, are these special, special, special people that are now coming through? Oh my goodness, absolutely. I mean, they are like, they are next level special. Like, they, I mean, like, I don't know how else to ex- describe it. And the beautiful thing is they actually have parents who are open to who they are and who are accepting and loving. And, uh, and, and not that my parents weren't, but it was way more difficult even, you know, um, even t- 10 years ago, you know, 20 years ago. So, 
So, yeah, I mean, these kids like and I and I deal with a lot of the parents of these children as well. And they come to me and they're like, Elizabeth April, you know, I've got this beautiful three year old boy who is convinced that he is a girl and he will wear nothing, you know, other than dresses. And I love him and I want to support him. And if that's what he wants, but he's going off to school in a year and I, I'm worried about what the kids are going to, you know, tell you know, um, I'm worried about the, what the kids are going to say to him, right? So there's there's a lot of concern coming from these parents that society just isn't going to be accepting of these beautiful children who are coming through. Wow. And the kids may well, be a lot uh, uh, more accepting than the adults. Oh, they yeah, are. They don't Absolutely. have the hang-ups like we do. Yeah. I just wanted to give you a warning that my I'm talking on Skype on my phone and it's running out of battery, so I'm going to switch over. Anyway, just in case. Okay, we're coming down like the last five or six minutes. So what are you going to be teaching us at the uh, Stargate to the Cosmos conference? You're coming um, and you're going to share your wisdom with the world. What um, mm -hmm. you have to, A couple workshops or not workshop, but whatever, lectures, whatever you call them. What, what's, what's your main focus? Yeah, so my main focus is basically, you know, getting right to the point of what do people need to know right now to expand their consciousness, to understand what's going on, to get the update. And what I've channeled that people need to know is all about the hybridization project. So the fact, first of all, that we're all hybrids in our own regard and what's happening to the future of humanity. I mean, where are we going? Why is there such a collapse? What is the future evolution of us as a species and a civilization? And I believe that that is these hybrid, these Asasani beings that are coming to this planet. So I'll be teaching people about that. My workshops, that's my presentation and lecture. My workshop will also be about um, gu guiding people through um, expanding themselves to understand their hybrid aspect. So who are you really? Who are you connected to? You know, what is your cosmic soul family? And and why are you here at this time? So I'll be guiding people through that during the workshop. Uh, and then the presentation will be all about the Mandela effect and the flipping of the 3D versus 5D realities and, uh, and all of that beautiful stuff. So some people think the hybrids are good or a good thing for humanity and some think it's bad how do you address that with the different people i believe everyone has their own perception um i i absolutely can see why people would perceive them as um, as as negative because people think that oh my goodness here comes another species from somewhere in the universe there's already no room on this planet you know how can we you know like they're gonna like I don't know, like take our, you know, it's kind of like the immigrants, like they're going to take our jobs or whatever. It's like, why, you know, right. I get where the fear comes from, but like, but we don't, they're not going to take over. They're going to live and cohabitate with us. They're not going to try and resist against us. So it's like, you know, I understand that there's a negative view on hybrids, but we are all hybrid. Like how can we hate on our own kind? You know, it doesn't make sense. So I will be explaining all of that great stuff at the uh, at the conference in October. You, you know, it's Absolutely. interesting about uh, take all our jobs. Uh, maybe we don't need jobs. Maybe we can uh, arrange for artificial intelligence to take care of all the boring things that that, that we call jobs, and while and let us do art and uh, sport and uh, yes. stuff like that. Well, Absolutely. let's look at that a little bit here, instead of just saying that and brushing past it. Yeah, the higher level civilizations, so uh, they take care of the basic functions of humanity in other ways rather than, you know, somebody dedicating their lives to being a garbage collector, right? <laughs> I mean, to, to humanity, that's a, uh, an honest living, but to a higher species, it's like, well, that can be automated. And in yeah. fact, they, you know, probably recycle 99% of it. Can you tell us a little bit about what you know about how, how higher... Um, civilizations level one and above uh, organize their, their societies and do things so it's not about growing in a job it's about do what you can do to uh, contribute to your society while you're incarnated in three in 3d form or whatever form you're in 
Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, what I've channeled, so I haven't really channeled a whole lot about, um, you know, other civilizations on planets, but I've been on the ships a lot. And, and, and it's really interesting. It, what surprised me right off the bat was how they have a, an organization system very similar to this government system. So I'm like, whoa, you know, you would think that something along the line would change or be different, but it's, it's uh, basically like the government, but not corrupt. Do you know what I mean? So, um, but there has to be some sort of organization and there has to be some sort of structure. And I guess that's just what it comes down to. Uh, but the interesting part about the government, you could call it, I don't know, um, the organization system is that especially with the grays, what I know is that you are tested when you are younger and based on the testing of when you were younger, you are put into the field that suits your energy and vibration the best. And this is a, such a, a proven key method that I would say 99% of the beings who are put into their respective fields based on their vibration and energy and consciousness, uh, they love what they do. Like they really do love what they do, whether it be engineering or science or technology or whatever, they love what they do. Um, and then if, that one person, that one individual really doesn't like where they got put or they're not really jiving with their job. They can actually go to a council, peti uh, petition their position, and uh, they can receive a different, uh, a different placement altogether. So it's a really open system. Oh, we're out of time. Good place to stop. Thank you so much. Elizabeth April. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. We'll be back in five minutes after this commercial break. Let's well, wrap Radio at freedomslips.com. We'll be right back after this message. You need some more speed records in this day and age. You need coverage. Coverage? Oh, you mean them little root weevils that crawl around popping off cameras in your face? Those root weevils write history. Many of you know that quote by Jack Nicholson and a few good men. You can't handle the truth. Well, you can, and Event Horizons will give you those truths. So when you're mad as hell and not going to take it anymore from that memorable scene in Network, you'll know just what to do. We will draw you in and become your news addiction at Event Horizons. Join us Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to noon Eastern Time at freedomslips.com. At Revolution Radio, our world team members are Dennis Fetcho, John Ilias, David Dunger, Hila Cass, MD, Melanie Richton, Jim Mars, Paula Harris, John Trello, Maria Payan, Christopher Husser, DODDS, Jonathan Orchard, and me, your anchor, Dr. Robin Falco. If uh, you decide not to volunteer, it will not be held against you in any way. Sounds dangerous. It is. Very dangerous. Count me in. And that's right here at Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, where information never sleeps. Is your data safe? Do you have the necessary information to assist you in confidently living through just about any survival situation? Is survival and gardening, off-grid living, medical knowledge, or even natural or man-made EMPs on your list of personal concerns? Do you have your documents and your personal information in a safe place in your hands where you know where it is? Well, check out our preloaded EMP-proof thumb drive. Over 3 gigs of survival documents and how-tos, plus the USDA offline food preservation website, and much, much more, including a surprise bonus we just can't tell you about here. With plenty of room left over to store your most important documents. Imagine if a mega virus or a computer failure took out your bank, or all the banks for that matter. Are your banking records safe in your hands so when they get things fixed and repaired, you can say, hey, look, this is what I had. You have it. I want it back. Is your personal data safe? Family records? Addresses? Phone numbers? Well, squeeze on over to 
freedomslips.com. Yes, that's www.freedomslips.com. Click the banner on the homepage for the EMP proof bullet drive to get the full scoop of everything that we offer. So, folks, keep your data safe for your peace of mind. Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. In breaking news, a visiting Syrian diplomat reported today that their population is evolving rapidly and advancing into a fifth dimensional consciousness. They are seeking peace with all cosmic cultures, which may mean that the Earth will be asked to join the prestigious Galactic Federation of Light Alliances. Please join Debbie West and Michael Hathaway on Lost Knowledge, Saturdays, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, in Studio A, for the latest breaking news on the Star Visitor's peaceful contact and the ongoing project of cleansing the Earth. This is the people's war. It is our war. We are the fighters. Fight it then. Fight it with all that is in us. And may God defend the right. Warning, warning. We gotta stop us! They're gonna kill us all! See how the trouble you've started? Be they a government, be they industry, be they organized labor, be they anyone, or human being! Time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart, that you can't take part. Even passively take part, and you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, by all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop, and you've got to win the day to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. Revolution Radio of FreedomSlips.com, the number one listener-supported talk radio station, throwing ourselves upon the gears of the machine. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. You called down the thunder, well now you've got it. Right, you tell them I'm coming, and hell's coming with me, you hear? Hell's coming with me! Revolution Radio! Radio every Wednesday 8 p.m. Eastern Time on Studio B for Momentary Zen with host Zen Garcia at freedomsteps.com, the people station. The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host... I haven't gotten Janet back on. Okay, I'll take it. Uh, tell me when to go. You're alive. The music's over. Oh, hello. Welcome back to uh, Revolution Radio. This is Dr. Sasha Lesson, and I'll soon be joined by uh, my co-host, Janet Kira Lesson. And we're privileged to uh, for this session to have Nadine Lett- La. How do you pronounce your last name? La... Lock. Lelich. 
Layla, you know, that's easy. I just, I just uh, made it hard on myself. <laughs> and um, so, this, so you know, I think that uh, you're such a, a clear um, story of somebody who's been through a lot and come through the other side. And so uh, for people who don't know you, I'd like you to just sort of tell your story, how you got into this. Uh, these experiences uh, that have uh, made you write this book uh, with uh, uh, Barbara Lamb? Um, well, uh oh. Uh, Can't hear you. June of 19, an abductee and contact me. And I went to and we were headed towards downtown Sedona. It was late. Um, this is June of 1991. And my friend Pamela and I were driving. We were going to camp in the back of my van. Hello. We pulled over to a day park. And um, I had an event that night. Well, I was fully awake. Uh, I had a strange feeling when we set up camp. It was about 11 o'clock at night. And we had decided to pull off into this camp area. It's a day camp, actually. And um, it's called Banjo Bill Picnic Site. And rather than go into town, we pulled over. And I felt like we were being watched. There was nobody there because, again, it was a day site and it was empty, uh, very dark. You could hear the water of uh, Oak Creek Canyon uh, in the distance rippling. Went to bed and we were sleeping in the back of the van in sleeping bags. And I heard sounds outside and I sat up to try to listen more clearly. And suddenly the back of the van opened up. And that day, that moment changed my life forever. Um, I was fully awake, took a second or two for my eyes to clear so I could see what was going on. Um, the, when I adjusted to the light, I saw three fingers and a thumb and a long, thin, gray arm reaching towards That was a staggering, shocking event for somebody who had never, ever the subject or contemplated, um, you know, the reality of the universe to that extent before. So it was, it was, uh, it was a shattering event. They did remove me from the van. I lost a few seconds of consciousness. I regained consciousness while I was standing at the back of the van. The lights were on. My friend was out cold in her sleeping bag. I was rendered paralyzed, but upright. Um, I raised my head forward I knew there was someone very tall and I sensed a lot of power standing in front of me and left and right of me because my eyes could I could see down and I could see because of the light of the vehicle was shining at the back I could see what at the time again there's no reference so what I saw in my mind's eye was two small bald children one on each side of me and that's really the only reference that I had and I'm frantically grasping in my mind trying to see what was happening to me they were able to levitate me up off the ground without touching me uh, they had their hands on each side of me about two or three inches cupped below my hands and I actually raised up off the ground and we moved forward um, I had a few instances where I went in and out and then I would regain consciousness and I just felt something hitting my face um, the next memory that I had was of seeing a very brilliant, bright light that we were moving towards. But I couldn't get a clear view of it because, again, my chin was tucked down flat and we were moving forward. That's all that I had of that. I, I came back into the van with a whoosh and a boom. It was like I was dropped straight from the sky through the top of the van. It was very strange. And I had originally, when I had been taken out of the van, I had been sitting upright listening to these sounds. And my legs were cross-legged. And interestingly enough, when I ended up, I came back into the van. I hit and literally bounced up off of the sleeping bag on top of it. My legs were folded again. And I was hysterical, completely, totally hysterical. It was about... I'd been gone an hour and a half, two hours, because uh, this happened after midnight. I could not wake my friend up at all until dawn came. When dawn came, uh, I was filled with such 
terror. I knew that it wasn't a dream. I was a student of psychology for a long time, and I loved the study of the human mind. I knew I didn't have a dream. I was very conscious during it, although I had moments that I blacked out. Um, I was terrified they were coming back again, and absolutely certain they were. The, the dawn arrived, and I was able to, uh, you know, I hopped out of the van. Uh, my friend awoke. Um, I gave her some background because we're very close friends. Um, and I gave her a little bit of background that something had happened to me. And curiously enough, when we got outside, we had left, we had emptied the van of all our camping equipment, which meant cooler food, Coleman lantern, all of our belongings had gone under this picnic table. When we went out in the morning, um, Everything was there except whatever belonged to me. All of my personal clothes, my backpack, my shoes, my towel, my bathing suit, anything like that was all and only my stuff. And we searched high and low all around the area and uh, we're not able to find anything. So we cut our vacation short and headed back because I was uh, quite, quite distressed. And uh, I... Anything happened there. Did they take your, the, the, what are grays going to do with your clothes? Do you have any idea? What comes uh, to mind? I have no idea. I have no idea. My, I don't know all of what was in that backpack. The purse was not in the backpack, but my clothing was in the backpack, shoes. Uh, there might have been books, those kinds of things, personal things, toothbrush, toothpaste, toiletries, those kinds of things were in there. But we never did find any of it. Mm -hmm. We found none of it. Um, I have no idea what that was about. But ultimately, you know, I, I wasn't ready to deal with that. Um, I, um, you know, it, it was a kind of a thing. And again, I, I, my, my whole history is working, my whole career, I worked in the legal field various positions and you know eventually as a, a coordinator and a paralegal and it was I come from a very conservative kind of environment I've got that kind of conditioning and um, I was terrorized by it so I went back home and what did happen to me is a very overwhelming desire to pack up and move uh, came over me and we had gone back, that was June of 91. Well, I went back and within a few months, I was on a plane flying to uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I didn't know anybody there. But I was just, I don't know, I was, I was obsessed to move into the boonies somewhere. And that's what I did. I, I packed up. I didn't own real estate at the time, so I was able to... Uh, my home, put the period on the sentence, and I moved out and headed to uh, the mountains up in Santa Fe. And no sooner did I get there than I began to have um, an intense, dramatic, ongoing contact of a wide variety. Um, and it was shattering to me. Um, it literally took another 13 years of that before I finally had, had enough and I, I stopped running. Um, during that time, my my peace of mind came from, because I was secret. The only person that knew what was happening was Pamela. And uh, I kept it secret. Uh, I, I, you know, I didn't want to be viewed in any, any negative light. I didn't have it answered. My ego didn't like it. Um, so the only outlet was talking to Pamela and journaling. So I have many, many books filled with journals uh, entries of these experiences and that gave me some what opportunity was, over the years to try to analyze what, what what's that was the ongoing what happened what 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 was ongoing what happened what else happened well, all right i went i went back what i noticed right away after this experience is that um you know all of a sudden i couldn't sleep anymore they were coming I started developing all these fears that had never existed before. And I, I think what happens, you know, I think that the human mind is an amazing thing. And I think we can handle things that, that 
our mind releases when we're ready, allows us to face these issues and things. And I had spent a great deal of time. You know, I had, I had, when I was a young woman in my 20s, I was struggling with a lot of issues, early childhood issues, uh, some substance abuse issues. And by the time I I was 28, 29. I was tackling all of that and doing very well. I spent a lot of years working on family of origin issues, lots of therapy, very aggressively addressing issues that came up in my life. And I'd had a, a tremendous amount of resolution, and I was so pleased with that. I had a great life. So when this thing happened, I was very angry also. Because balance and good mental health has always been very, very important to me. And it's always been a goal of mine to continue to work on myself in this area. Then out of the blue, or so I think, this thing happens. So I was very angry, but I noticed a lot of things started happening to me. I started feeling, um, I, why was I going to Santa Fe, first of all? I wasn't sure. I really wasn't sure. I couldn't tell my friends exactly why I was going. I had to go. But once I got there... I lived in a. I moved, lived outside um, of Santa Fe, uh, not too far, but really pretty remote. I mean, you would in those days. This was. Uh, I moved in January of '92, and you would step outside of town, and in five minutes, you're in the boonies. So, I noticed that suddenly I was afraid. I was checking closets. I was checking behind my seat. Now, this isn't, wasn't my behavior. I had a few paranoid feelings that they're coming. They're coming to get me. They're going to get me. Uh, this stuff started to develop this internal fear of this thing. I started looking in closets and, and putting extra locks on my doors. And then I would get these, these feelings that would just, and it could come at 12 o'clock at night, get in the car and drive. Out. I'm getting in the car at 12 o'clock at night and driving out of town into the hills all, all by myself for no reason at all. Well, of course, this is where abductions were taking place. And um, right. so I started seeing things, hearing things, and just began to start recording all of this. And obviously what was happening is my awareness of the abduction phenomena in my life was coming to the forefront. And I was slowly, slowly coming to accept that there was something very uh, out of the ordinary happening to me. And it went into all of my books. And um, I tried, I did go to see one therapist when I was in Santa Fe. But my mind, you know, still wasn't quite ready. And so she tr tried uh, hypnosis a couple of times with me. But I was so hysterical about that incident. We did learn that, of course, I was taken on a craft. The things, I felt something hitting my face in that original experience. What that was is we were going through the woods, and the boughs of the branches were not hitting the smaller, they were grays, I came to understand later, but they were hitting my face as we were moving through. And indeed, we did go to a craft, and we did discover that much, um, that I did go through those very typical examinations on craft. Um, but we couldn't get anywhere with it because... Every time she tried, um, I, I became hysterical, literally hysterical and physically flailing my arms. And this woman did not know what to do. She, she wasn't familiar with this particular subject, um, mm -hmm. but she was afraid for me. So that is the, act, the only time I attempted early on to explore with another person. Um, and then the, they continued. Uh, on a variety of contexts, what continued for the next 13 years and to this day. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Have you come to peace with it, or is it still upsetting to you? Oh, no, 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 no. I, I very, very, very much now and eventually is, you know, the contacts take place and I, I know you, you've been involved in this field a lot longer than I have, but the contacts also take place. There are a variety of contacts. There are fully conscious physical contacts. There are astral contacts. They contact you in a lucid dream state. They upload, they download into your mind. They put 
implants in, all of these things have happened to me, a wide variety of things. And it's taken a long time for me to accept this because, you know, like your previous guest, I know she's, she's a younger person and she's fully embraced into this level of this truth in a different way. I come from a very conservative background. Okay. So this has kind of been, it's taken a long time for me. Uh, I have a few baby steps and I'm, I'm a, I want proof. I want proof. That's, but I, that's my legal background. So it's been difficult from that standpoint. And I recognize that you cannot get a lot of proof when it comes to um, contact with extraterrestrials, interdimensionals, uh, you, you know, when it comes to that aspect. But so, so it's over the years, it's sort of like I could take a few baby steps and I'd say, okay, I accept this now. But over here, oh, no, 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 can't go there. But give me another six, six months or a year, of, then yes, I'm over there too. So it's been a process for me. Um, and I, I'm not at all of any of these issues. And the fear stayed with me probably for, at 13 years, I went to my first MUFON meeting. I met Barbara Lamb. Um, she was fabulous. Uh, within a couple of years, she and I got together and we wrote the book, Alien Experiences, 25 Cases of Close Encounter, Never Before Revealed. Um, and, and you know, I ended up getting a, a hundred of her cases, going back home with them. And that was the first exposure I had ever had to other contactees. And I would, you know, I'd wow. work at the law firm during the day. I'd come home and I'd go through these files. It took three years to finish this book. And so this is back in like 2006, 2007. And I'd come late hours of the morning and I'd be going through these files and I'd be going, oh my God, he's describing exactly the same thing that happened to me. But this guy was 20 years earlier down in Florida and I've never been exposed uh, to this information. And that was the thing I also wanted to do is that for years I did not expose myself to anything until I had my own recollections fully recorded on paper for myself before I even went to a MUFON meeting, before I even stepped out and talked to even Barbara. So by the time I was talking with her in 04, 5, 6, and then the book came out in 07, I was still, you know, still had some angst about this. I wasn't happy about it. Um, I was still a little angry that I had to deal with it. But suddenly, 2007, the book came out, and I'm getting asked to talk. So I start talking. Okay. And very hard for me. It was very, very difficult for me. You see a lot of people stand up, and even you guys, you can talk very openly about things. That wasn't like that for me. It was very challenging. But slowly, I started becoming more acclimated to it. Um, I can, I'm a good public speaker, but it's not something I would necessarily choose to do had I not been find, my, find myself in this environment, this situation. All, all of a sudden, around 2009, 2010, an entirely different type of experience happens to me. And I'm completely taken aback because I'm just to the point of to a place in my life where I'm saying, all right, I fully accept that the universe is full of life. Uh, a variety of extraterrestrials I've been exposed to already now. I fully examine this. My feet are, you know, my feet are on the ground. I'm a logical person. I fully accept that this is happening to me and I believe it's happening worldwide. I'm there. Yeah. I'm on that page. Um, I've got 10 different beings that I've seen myself in my experiences. But all of a sudden, what happens after I stand up and start to talk about it, all of a sudden, I have an experience that has military people in it. Oh. And now a whole different, uh -oh. my world has turned around a whole different direction. And, and wow. uh, I, I'm stuck. Go ahead. Wow. So, military. Okay, anyway, I have one question before. Yeah, before you go to the military thing, I have one question. So we're looking. People always say, "Well, you have no evidence," but in a court of law, you can convict somebody to death or prison in life based on um, testimonials, right? So, how do we find evidence? Well, you well, know, we're not sometimes get, well, yeah. shoot a gray and bring it into. The, go ahead. No, no, I mean. 
You know, actually, it's funny you mention that because I'm working on my book right now. It's going to be out in a couple of weeks, and it's called Evolution, Coming to Terms with the ET Presence. And Mm -hmm. the goal of that whole book, um, it's telling my whole and complete story, which is very, very involved and detailed. And only a small portion was in the first book. And this is really um, uh, sort of a coming of age for me. uh, And... I was examining just what you're talking about, evidence. And I get asked to write articles here and there on these subjects. And so I like to look at evidence. I like to look at what is feasible to present, you know. And it's difficult for all of us contactees and abductees. And we can talk about our astral consciousness going here. We can talk about these meetings. And I've had some experiences like, you know, Elizabeth April was talking about, you know, where I have recollections of being at tables with multiple beings, Okay, I have this now. Mm-hmm. Now I have a different way of talking about it. Go ahead. No, I just said, uh, yeah, I have the same thing, and I'm really curious because I get this all the time. Like, how do we do? I'm very interested in your book and and your conclusion. So let's talk a little bit about it here, and uh, everybody. You know, I hope you have the book with you when you come to um, Stargate. In oh, October yeah, in Albuquerque. Yeah, yeah. But, I will. Oh, yeah. So you're looking at evidence. And you have a different way to symbol it than Elizabeth does. Okay, so go ahead. Well, no, I, I, it's not necessarily a different way because, I mean, what do we have here? We have testimony. It's true. And you mentioned the fact that legally we can convict somebody. That is a possibility, but things are a little still iffy in the court system about one person standing up. So I was doing some research for my book recently in regard to this very thing. And um, when it comes to personal testimony, they're still finding 25%. You know, they're bringing a lot of cases where people have gone to prison, they've been convicted, and later on they've done DNA testing only to find out that those person they had not committed that crime. And so what they're finding is that they're one of the things they're looking at when it comes to uh, witness testimony is the confidence level of the person. They are, so we're talking about if we're giving testimony, number one, about 25% of that's going to be incorrect just by memory, but the way our consciousness is, the way the human mind stores memory. Then the other 75% is going to be more relevant depending on how confident that person is. For example, if you asked me about what happened that night, June 1990, I'm absolutely confident. I'm absolutely confident that I was taken. I don't have any doubt about it. Okay? Now, there's other circumstances that have happened to me that, you know, and I use percentages to myself, and I talk about that in this next book. Um, You have to leave room for interpretation you have to leave room for the fact that like a lot of people when they're contacted and especially early on they're terrified when we have these tremendous emotional turmoils going on inside of us it affects how we see and record things it affects it it affects our perspective um so testimony is very viable but the next level I was looking at for my book in is to, how do we validate these things, right? Well, a, a lot of things they were talking about, were, you know how they're talking about, uh, is it Nibiru, the planet traveling? And yeah, they can't Nibiru, see yeah, the huh? planet, but they consider Nibiru, right? And they say, well, we can't see it with the human eye, but we see the effect of its movement. And that's true, like, right. if you even look at, If you look at quantum physics and you see the movement of quarks, they cannot see quarks. But a quark, as it moves, it leaves a trail. And that trail is a little electrical trail that they can actually photograph. So it's the same kind of thing. When we're looking at trying to tell the world, which we need to tell the world, we're in contact we're being abducted, we're being contacted. Um, some of it appears from some beings that maybe not have our best interest, and some of them have our highest interest. They want to save the planet, right? They want to see our species evolve. But we can't prove a lot of this. We come back, some of us, so some of the evidence would be marks on our body. Now, I st- about, I don't know, four or five weeks ago, I woke up in the morning and 
it, it seems like active because I backed off for a while. I'm also a cartoonist doing children's books. I backed off for about a year and I was really involved in that. Now I step back in this field again really actively and I start having more experience. It's as though, it's as though we draw our, our, their attention to us, sort of. I woke up about four or five weeks ago and on my, my right shoulder I had a very distinct and I have a photograph of it in my book a very distinct triangle on my shoulder and it was um three puncture marks and then when you when you would touch my skin underneath there was a big hollowed out area where it was almost as though something had been scooped out underneath the skin well that's never happened to me before okay and i took a i took a few photographs of it so here's evidence so what is this right um, and so, cause I'm always, I want to see as much physical evidence as I can. I want to see the, you know, if you've got 500,000 people that are having an effect, it's sort of like the tail of the cork. You see an effect of, from something. There is an effect mm-hmm. here. And right. so that is sort of an evidence. We got an evidence. Something's going on. Right. Um, but this mm-hmm. physical thing happened and I didn't know anything about it. So I went online uh, It come to find out I had no idea. Um, even to this point of where I'm at now in my awareness, I had no idea about this triangle. And I went on and I've already collected like four or five other photographs of people that had, had the exact same thing in their skin. They woke up with the same thing. Right. Different I've, people, I've had different times. Marks. So the scoop, marks, scoop marks are common and I've had it. I have scoop marks, yes. So. Well, this, you, you know, the other thing- this, this triangle thing. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, go ahead. What were you going to say, say, Sasha? Well, you, yeah, oh, go I ahead, just, Sasha. Yeah, what were you going to say, Sasha? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, the one the evidence that's really interesting that, that is, is physical is both the military and the ETs put some kind of uh, devices, very small devices sometimes, in people. And, and uh, Dr. Lear and others have examined them. And you alluded to... Uh, right. having uh, implants. And I, I just wondered, uh, yes. w- w- tell me about that. Well, uh, now, I classify my experiences sort of like in four different ways for me. I mean, everybody has their own way. I mean, I like Bud Hopkins and David Jacobs. They have their own, you know, they had their own criteria. For me, my criteria, I can only judge my own, right? So I have, like I told you, fully conscious, fully aware. I have the, um, where I actually feel as though my body's been removed. And there's times I've actually floated above my body and seen it laying on the bed. So I, I have these different levels. Um, one of these experiences uh, was really intense. And it began as a me fully awake and a lot of times I would wake up and I would know there was someone in my room. I would know there was someone in my room and I would sit up in bed and swear that I saw a gray at the bottom of my bed. And, um, and one of these occasions I, I was, and now I express it differently because I still struggle. It appeared to me right. that I was physically taken and put on a craft. Yes. So, I'm getting feedback here. Are you? Yes, I hear that. Matt, any ideas? I'm um, trying to fix I'm it. I'm going to adjust your... Okay, Matt's trying to fix it. He's on it. He's on it. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, okay, try so anyway, in this instance, there's a whole line of people. And I mean probably 10 or 12 people in line. And in front of me, at the end of that line, there were a number, there were PCs, not the show, and chair. And I have this in my book also. It almost looked like a dental chair, except it was straight up. Uh, go, go ahead, keep talking. I know it's annoying, but we can, we can still hear you. Oh, we're all getting feedback. Okay. I don't know what's going on. Okay. And the arms came straight. <laughs> so the person... Each person would be placed standing up against this, almost like a cross, and strapped to it. And the ETs were putting these implants 
in the, up the nasal cavity of all these people. And I can recall standing in line, but I was very calm about it. And I was in line with the rest of them, and I could hear this man screaming and screaming at the top of his lungs in absolute sheer terror. And it was just a, a you know, curdling scream. Um, and I know that at that I planted in my sinus cavity. Uh, one of the other things, we, we looked for evidence. After the experience, and I have all these escalating experiences and contacts, suddenly I'm having all kinds of ear bleeds and nose bleeds. I'd wake up in mm-hmm. blood all over my pillow, from my sinuses or from my ears. Uh, so I believe something happened on that occasion. I had, uh, I was, I had already talked to Dr. Lear. I was going to have an implant taken out of my hand and I was making an appointment um, to have that done that I believed was an implant. And literally the day before you could move that thing around, it totally disappeared from my hand. If, was it something? Um, I don't know. But, but just before it was going to be taken out, it was gone. And it would look like a grain of rice. It was like a grain of rice, and it was located at the base of my middle finger on my right hand. And, and mm-hmm. twice we were planning and did not do it. Second time, I was, we were going through with it. I was making the appointment, and the thing totally disappeared. Another occasion happened, and I have a drawing of that actually in the first book with Barbara, and I have more detail in the new book, where during what appears to be on a craft, these training sessions with this technology, uh, there's these, these sound tubes and um, I'm tr- uh, that I'm sitting at this table with sound tubes and these light light boxes and I don't have any clothes on. There is an insectoid. I've only seen one my whole experience and it's always the one with me showing teaching. It was in front of me, but there was a gray behind me and the seat was opened at my spine. And I remember the pain. I couldn't move forward. And they were putting something directly into the lower part of my. Uh, one of the occasions I was out having one of these experiences and I was told I had seven implants in my body. Uh, you know, um, okay, let's, let me let me talk about yeah. that for a minute because this is very powerful. I have I have the experience of the, the nasal implant and um, okay. I've had sinusitis and. You know, dripping into my lungs, polyps my entire life. It has been a torturous <laughs> life. <laughs> and and I'm always on the edge because the damn right. things, the polyps grow back and I have to go get surgery again. And I remember getting right. it. I've got one behind my right ear. I'll remember getting it. So, and then uh, I went to one time, for some reason, my friends took me to this lady and I didn't know why I was going there, but she just started reading me. And the same thing. I have, like, I, I forgot to count. Like you said, seven, eight, nine implants. She told me mm-hmm. that they were for various mm-hmm. reasons. Like, one would prevent um, me from getting um, AIDS or whatever. And one was, you know, they were there mm-hmm. to protect me. And definitely there was a tracking device and the communications. So I'll put it back. In, I just want to comment on that, that I, I too, have these. Oh, when I got the one behind my ear, I was about four years old, and my mother took me to the doctor because it swelled up. And the doctor didn't have any idea what it was. This is back, uh, I was born in 54, so I was probably, it was probably 58, 59. I mean, what did they know about that back then? So they didn't know what to do about it. Okay, back to you. Uh, oh, well, you know, I would just, it's, yeah. I find it interesting. It, it's kind of a, an experiment that you, you uh, might want to. Uh, do Nadine is you could take that uh, that grain of rice thing whether you ever saw it or you just uh, pictured in your mind what it was like and if you were to pretend that you were that device and identify with it entirely and state your existence and say what you're like as the implant uh, what would you say oh I think it was a tracker ah it was either a tracker or something to mon- monitor my body functions. That's what I think. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I think I what think about the thing that's it? really interesting is... Go ahead. 
Well, I think that this is an interesting way to proceed with each of these devices because uh, the fluidity of consciousness, if you identify with each in its turn, uh, and, and of course I wonder if the uh, military also gave you some too. Yes, they did. Now the military experiences are very, very, very different, very conscious very conscious there is no sparkling light coming into your room there's no sense of floating they come in your front door they walk you out they inject you with a needle my dogs react it's a very different dynamic very very different um this appeared i you know i said 2009 2010 after i started talking and all of this thing happened and the first one was shocking because it happened just I was living in a condo and um, I woke up fully awake and there was a shadow by the window of a man standing there and my dog was going ballistic my one dog Annie and next thing I knew I couldn't move. and um, that was a dynamic experience um, that involved a black helicopter hovering side Silently over the back of, we had uh, carports back there behind all the condos. And I was walked out with literally this like blanket thing over top of my head. They're very, very different. Um, I, I've had several instances of being taken to a facility underground, uh, one of them actually underwater. Um, and all of these, thank God, I'm so, um, <laughs> I'm so meticulous about detail that all of these things got recorded in my books, thank God, in my journals, everything. And I, I had all my writing here right there. I drew my pictures, everything. And, it, you know, being able to remember and, and, and writing it down is so vitally important if we're going to get a greater and greater picture of what's really going on here right. and in the cosmos. The more we can record right. and the, the, the more alert and conscious we can be, uh, we start to create this, um, this evidence of effect of what's happening on all of us, you know, and um, I think it's really, really important. And I think the legal field was so helpful for me because I'm so detail oriented, you know, preparing cases for right. trial. And, um, and I think that was really uh, well, when, quite when shocking. When you were taken places, but, how do you know where you were taken? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you were sorry. So you're very detail oriented. Where were you? How do you know where you were taken? Yeah. You, well, you know they have your hood on well, you and they don't. For example, uh, all right. In this particular experience, um, now it was cool out, and all I had was a nightgown on, and I was barefoot. Okay. Mm hmm Right. Okay. There were several. They don't care about that. <laughs> they don't care. No. No. Yeah. And. I was walked out. My feet were on the cement on the sidewalk. And I was fully conscious of my feet moving. They had indeed injected me while I was still lying in bed with something that would say, okay. okay. But I still had a great deal of awareness. I, what they put around me is kind of like a, blan a blanket or something, but it was partially over my head. So when I was walking from the sidewalk, there was one on each side of me, walking from the sidewalk towards where that um, that helicopter was overhead and it was very close to the ground. I mean, you know, it had to be no more than 50 feet up just silently over, over the, um, the asphalt, over the parking area. And then when we got there, the thing came off of my head and I'm looking up and I, I had a heck of a time because it looked like a helicopter and yet there wasn't a sound on it. And so uh, this ex experience, I went in and out, which is, you know, fairly common, at least for me, whether it's an ET experience or it's a military experience, I fight as hard as I can to grab a hold of my consciousness and try to stay alert because that's my sense of control, if you will, right? So I'm not a victim. Mm -hmm. And so um, you, you get pieces in and out. And uh, I've got that in my book where you, you're looking at a piece of film and you see the full frame after frame it's very intact and then you're having an experience whether it's military or et and you it's cut into puzzle pieces with nothing in between that's how it is for me and if you do hypnosis uh, regression hypnosis 
you try to fill in from puzzle piece to puzzle piece, those blank spaces. Mm -hmm. That's what happened in this one. I miss, I miss entirely. I get into that helicopter. I'm sitting in there. We take off and I can see the ground beneath me, but then I lose consciousness. And the next thing I recall, I'm all of a sudden I'm in a, I'm in a ground craft, but I, I can actually see because there are some windows and I can, I can describe the whole thing in my book where there's a pillar. There are two, uh, and it's, it's humans and ETs to, in this craft. And there are, are small window panes in the front. We're heading in that direction where I can actually see outside. And we hit the water. And, and I somehow I know that we are uh, over the uh, somewhere near. And we hit the water water and I can clearly remember and I'm sitting in a chair and I'm semi-paralyzed I can't move and there's another man there a man sitting like me there are military off to one side talking to each other and but I can't move my head so it's a side view but I, I can see forward where I can see some kind of control being done in this craft clear pillars is straight through this saucer type room that I'm in and then I see the windows and I see when we hit it, it jolts when we hit the water. And you can actually see the water in those panes when we go under. So mm -hmm. I have, through this whole particular experience, I am on and then I am off. And then once we go to this underwater facility, it's very, very clear to me. Most all of it I remember consciously. So I was in an And there is when they water. interrogate you. Wow, okay. you also. Yeah, so I'm very interested in this part. And we have about 10 minutes, so go ahead. What did you see in the underwater what they, underground facility? Yeah, what were they doing? What did they what ask did you when ahead. they interrogated you? And what did they interrogate you Well, about? Okay, go ahead, Nadine. All right, first of all, okay, what they did first of all is when we came in here, um, you come out of this craft, Water's dripping everywhere. You come in and you go underneath this this facility, and then the, the platform rises up. Water drips off of it. You come down from the center of this craft, and they take you into like a hazmat unit. And the other man went into one, and I went into the other. Where there's a nurse in there, they take injections, they take your blood, they check your heart, and they dressed us in these blue gowns. They lead me now. I don't. But eventually we end up in the same room. It's a small room. Uh, the room did not look very big. There was only one door in. There, there's a table. And sitting at the table are two consoles. And they kind of look like what our regular monitor looks like on our computer. And, you know, the way we have, um, you know, now Apple has all the push button stuff where you just touch the screen. It was like that. And you sit down, and we're and right in front of us is a big window, and the window is probably five feet high and eight feet wide, and on the other side of the glass is a whole room full of military people in uniforms looking at us. And I'm on the left, and this man is on the right. And they bring us in and set us down, and um, we can see those uh, military people on the other side, and this man is very, very angry, and he's hollering at me, don't tell them anything, don't tell them anything, don't let them know anything. And I don't know why he's saying that to me. This is my first recollection of one of these experiences. And uh, we're sitting there. A doctor that comes in looks like a doctor, and this is a foggy area for me because I cannot look at him directly. Is he, is he uh, an ET? Is he a human? And I also could not discern for sure if... They were asking, this guy was asking questions telepathically or vocally. I couldn't, I cannot recall that. But what they wanted us to do basically was to look at this panel and all these little buttons would pop up and the buttons are about one inch, one and a half inches square and they all pop up. What we're supposed to do is push the button of all the things that we have seen. Did, did we see this? Were we taken there? Did that happen there? And it's all being recorded into this electronics. The guy that's standing next to us and leaning over us, kind of guiding this, while well, the military looking through the window, he is holding uh, like an electronic pad, and he is taking information into there. There are monitors on us, sticky 
monitors on us at the same time. And they want to know which ETs did you see? What did they want? What were the crafts like? Uh, were there implants? Um, what were their intentions? Uh, how many different ETs did you see working together? Uh, all those kinds of questions like that. And, mm -hmm. um, well, these people are watching. And the, the funny thing is that I recognized somebody. When I came out of this experience, um, and again, I think the way we talk about our state of consciousness during these is very important. I just do. If we want, want the world to really listen to what we have to say, okay? Mm -hmm. For me to tell you that it feels exactly like full, complete consciousness right now is not true most of the time. There are times that are like that. But most of these things, you kind of go in and out. It's a choppy thing. I fully recollect this. Well, you're drugged, you know, there are right? times you're when, drugged. Yes. Yes. You're, you're drunk, and they so do, it makes you go into that consciousness. Right. Yes. yes. And there are times you pinch yourself. There are times I've gone, there are times that I am so grounded in experience that I am just going, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I'm really here. I'm here. Feel this table. Touch this. Remember this needing. Take it in. I am here. This is real in the 3D physical world. It's so powerful. And sometimes it isn't right. that powerful, you know. And um, anyway, when I was exiting from this room, peeking back through that hazmat unit, there was a man with gray mustache and gray hair in a military outfit that came up to me and patted me on the shoulder and told me I did a good job. And I recognized him from another experience that had happened. And oh, um, wow. he he was very familiar to me. And now I was certain that this, you know, it was funny because when we block, sometimes we block these things. It's just overwhelming, you know, and you'll have to, and for me, it's like, just give me a little bit of time, the process, okay? I'm trying to get a whole, whole new cosmic view of everything here. Because that's what we're talking right. about. We're talking about such a radical shift of human consciousness about the true reality. It doesn't come in a snap of a finger. It's a process for each individual. That's what, what my future work in, in my book that I'm doing now, that's where I want to focus on how do we process this, aid the evolution of consciousness so we actually do become cosmic citizens. We drop the, the, the BS, we step out into the real world, right? And to help people stop being afraid. You asked me earlier, am I afraid? No, I'm not afraid anymore of anything. But I'm a spirit in a physical, you know, in a physical body. I know that. I've known that for a long time. My spiritual life is a very rich life. And so that's where my grounding comes and a lot of my processing. I, I have my foundation that uh, I know how that this is just the third dimension, you know. Um, so I'm excited about the future. I'm looking forward to more that I will learn, more sharing, more telling of my own experiences and hearing others. But I, I really want to tell and share in a way that the absolute non-believers might stop for a second and go, oh, because we can sometimes talk about this. Those that are familiar with it, we can talk in way out terms. Well, if we want to bring more of the closed minded people in, it's, it's tough to do that. You know, there's got to be a way right. to slowly bring them along too. And we can talk to each other in the higher dimension, but we want to awaken everybody. So that's what I'm trying to find a way where I can bridge that, act as a liaison in creating, um, you know, a, such explanation of these things that somebody might actually stop and say, oh, okay, well, yeah, I'll take that first step, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you you well, know, that's my the, the, the yeah, reality is that, that you subject to all kinds of criminal behavior uh, by our uh, so-called trusted government who's kidnapped you, uh, you know, without your consent. But, you know, uh, uh, and right. you're okay with that. I'm, well, here's the not much thing. you can do, honey. Am I okay <laughs> with it? No. I, okay, I'm not okay with it. But see, you have to pick your battles carefully and put your, there's only so much energy and time any of us have, right? Now I can mm -hmm. sit around and, you know, I can, and I'm involved in some local politics and my I'm too involved in the world at large politics because I'm interested in the cosmos. 
It says rise above it, operate from spiritual plane only. Do not participate in the chaos. There are some battles we can't win. You know, so I'm trying to find a platform where it will actually impact. I don't want to stand out there and duke it out with Trump or or the Clintons. I don't want to do that because that's this that's right. the physical realm of third dimension based on ego. It's not going anywhere. You know, uh, I'm trying mm-hmm. to find a platform that will go past that because isn't that where we want to go? Right. We want to go to the cosmos. Take, take we want to operate road. in a different level. Yeah. Yeah. Take the higher. And no, I'm not okay road. with any of it. But yeah. I wasn't okay. Mm-hmm. I wasn't okay with the ET thing in. But I'm making peace with it because only from a standpoint of peace and being centered can I look at what's going on and can I move through it. I I can't stop the ET contacts, whatever these things are. I've been able to stop them. I haven't been able to stop the military intervention. So okay, if I can't stop it, what can I do? How can I take this information and use it in a way that will become positive and empower me rather than take me down? I don't want to waste my time fighting. I want to take mm-hmm. this information right. and take it to the world in a, in a way that will raise everybody up. I always That's say bring inspiring. it on because on some level, on some level, they can't touch us, like on the spiritual level, right? And once once you know that, you know. Yes. That. Yes. So bring yes. it on. So I'm going to report it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. On some level, they can't touch us. That's so true. And so I'm trying to rise above the chaotic view of it. You know? Last, and how can I left, be of uh, service? We have one minute left. We'll have to wrap it up. We'll do some more later uh, meeting. Go ahead. Uh, how do people uh, get your book and all that stuff? Uh, what is it again titled? Oh, shoot. Uh, the time. book is... Uh, alien experiences book to you called evolution coming to t- terms with the et presence it'll be out by him on uh, uh most you know amazon and barnes and Noble. Mm-hmm. thank you dear we can't hear you more aloha love and blessings i'll have it on the website thank you so much <laughs> thank you Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com and we'll be right back after this message. Thank you for listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. Any commercial advertising you may hear in this program is of the sole discretion and benefit of the host of whose program you are listening to. Revolution Radio does not endorse any commercial products, nor does it accept monetary compensation for on-air advertising of commercial products, nor will it ever. We are and shall remain 100% listener supported. Any product advertising on this program are considered used at higher risk, and Revolution Radio shall not be held liable for any claims or damages received from any product advertised within this program. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. for tuning in to Revolution Radio. Here at Revolution Radio, we are listener-sponsored and commercial-free. But there still are bills to pay. In order to raise some needed funds to cover the cost, our station is offering a silver special. In the continental United States for a $60 donation, or in Alaska, Hawaii, or Canada for a $70 donation, we will send you an uncirculated 2018 one-ounce pure silver eagle. The $70 donation, uh, the extra 10 is to cover shipping, by the way, outside of the continental United States. When making the donation, you must put Silver Eagle promo in the notes on the donation. And thank you for tuning in to Revolution Radio at revolution.radio and freedomslips.com. Without you, there is no less. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. Take a look around, kid. What do you see? Homes being foreclosed. 
People working two, three jobs just to put food on the table and still drowning in debt. Don't get me wrong. This country was founded on great ideals and principles. They've all been ruined by the banks. Open your eyes to banks that are robbing you. You know who my favorite president was? Who? Oh. Alice Jefferson. Because he saw all of this coming and tried to stop it. He fought the banks. JFK too, and they killed him for it. The banking institution is more dangerous than an army, he said. He also said that every generation needs a revolution, Jimmy. The American dream is just that. Just a dream. War is a continuation of politics. Only by other means. Politics is a continuation of economics by other means. This is our bank. This is our...